Hi, this is Mary Jensen, oral care specialist with the High Life Oral Health Alliance. Get ready for your unofficial dental hygiene podcast. These are the tales of two hygienists, one East Coast RDH and one West Coast Gygenist. Listen as they tackle the profession of dental hygiene with humor and enthusiasm. Now, please join Michelle Strange and Andrew Johnston as they tell you a tale of two hygienists. Welcome to episode 94 of A Tale of Two Hygienists. This is Michelle. And this is Andrew. Um, <laughs> well, yes. So, hi, stranger. Hi. It's been a while yeah. since I've seen you. Uh, what like is it, like 40 four days? <laughs> yeah, something like that. Hasn't been that long. But we were in Iowa on Friday. Yep. And that Iowa was state meeting. amazing. Yes. I w- well, I finally knocked Iowa off my list of states to visit, but I feel like it wasn't fair because we were, well, I was there for, soon, let's see, what time did I land? Uh, 1030? 1030. 10, 11, 12, five. 1, 2, 3, so six and a half hours I was in Iowa. Yeah. I actually was on a plane longer than I was in Iowa. <laughs> Oh, that's bad. That w- that's really bad. And I was there a lot longer than you. I was there 22 hours. Yeah. <laughs> no, I was less than that, probably 20 hours. But still, like, I You Iowa, got to see awesome people. Yeah. The, I, I think that's what it was. It's like, I feel like I didn't really get gypped that much because I saw the people that I wanted to see. Mm-hmm. So I feel good about that. Yep. So we were there presenting to the students, um, Iowa's uh, Dental Hygiene Student Association, whatever, I I don't know, I guess they're not always an association, but um, we were talking about how to stay engaged after Mm. hygiene school and how engagement and CE and staying informed are kind of very cyclical things and you can't really have one without the other. Mm -hmm. So we enjoyed it and we are happy to come and present to any other students that are or people schools whatever that want to help get their students to stay engaged afterwards i mean this is going to be a growing i think presentation for us yeah i want something we're passionate about you know like you and i do hundreds of hours of ce every year and we're always going to conferences and we just you know it's just a really good way i, I think it's you know maybe a foundation of being a better hygienist is just getting good CE all the time. And that's how you're going to stay engaged. And then you're going to want to take the CE. I, you're right. It's just, it's cyclical. So, um, it's a, it was fun. And I, and I think the, the students did a really good job of if they weren't really engaged, they did a good job pretending to be engaged. So thank you. <laughs> and shout out to the yeah. Iowa students that were there. Thank you for making us feel better about ourselves. Well, we also had a poll like, so mm. I have this polling software that I use for all my presentations with Tepe and, or my, actually a lot of my implant maintenance uh, presentations, because I think it's always important to uh, understand who is in your audience, but not everybody mm. wants to tell you what they, usually what they don't know. They'll, ha- they're happy to tell you what they do know, but they don't want to tell you what they don't know. Yeah. And because so this it's, is the, they're scared of being judged by yeah. everyone else. Of course, so. we all are. And so it's it's really nice to um, have them, you know, take a poll and just kind of understand where they are and what their thoughts are. But then they had the ability to ask us um, questions anonymously through this yeah. app, which was nice. Which uh, we kind of blew. That was my fault probably for talking too much during the presentation. But I, I didn't realize there was that many questions to get through. And like... They had well, a the lot thing of questions, is, too. Well, what we had like four come in during the presentation, but then as soon as we started to ask them, it was like yeah. a flood of yeah. um, questions. So I guess sorry, I could have put that up on that. the screen so that you could have actually seen it, too, because that's the hard part about having two presenters. And we don't yeah. want to stand at the podium and just like, you know, hang out next to each other. <laughs> That'd be weird. Yeah. Which we I think we did a good job. <laughs> we did a good job of staying on the other side of the room from each other for that, yeah, for that whole thing. For sure. That was good though. That was it was a really nice venue and there was yeah, there was over two hundred students, I think, that were there. They had mm-hmm. a really good attendance. Um Debbie yeah. Z was there. We saw Debbie Z. Uh-huh. Um but yeah, so thanks everyone again from Iowa that was helping us with especially Tanya. Tanya and Ray yes, was our Tanya and Wright. go-to we person for that. that. Mm-hmm. But you know, we, we saw Emily and Jessica that was and there. Yeah, yeah. So a lot of people. Lots of people. It was really fun. So, yeah. 
Um, for the hot second that we were there. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't you mind know going back. Oh, I wouldn't either. So right now, I mean, I know this is so surprising, but I'm in a Facebook thread discussion. I don't call, I call it an argument, but this, what we're talking about is like the staying engaged and staying informed. Like this is such a good example because what we're talking about is the cardiovascular, like how uh, quick, and I talked about this weeks ago, like when can you see a patient after a heart attack? And, you know, mm-hmm. everyone's just like, call the cardiologist six months, car- call the cardiologist six months. I'm like, damn it. No, like we should, <laughs> <laughs> what in my, my, I'm being a little less aggressive, I hope, on this discussion board because I see she's learning. Where I get everyone, a don't heated. worry. I mean, the, the, that definitely will uh, only last for so long. But I, what I really hope people understand is that cardiologists know what they know, and we know what we know. Mm-hmm. And I probably know as much about cardiovascular therapy as they know about oral health. Right? Could be. I mean, I, I'll probably on the whole, maybe, yeah. No, I'm going to say, yeah, absolutely. Because this one person was told that her husband shouldn't have a cleaning for a year because they could, we could dislodge the bacteria. It's like, honey, that bacteria is in that sulcus and it's in the bloodstream. And if you dislodge it, you're actually doing a favor (laughs) for your patient. Right, right, right. We have to get rid of chronic infection. And so if that patient had a freaking ingrown nail, I guarantee you there would be more thought and consideration into getting that cleared up than anything in the mouth. So I know what I know, they know what they know, and we should have a conversation about it. Not just like call the cardiologist and treat them like they're omnipotent, like we're not medical providers and that we don't have a patient in the chair where we know their level of oral health. I just want everyone to be so sound in their knowledge and what they are doing for patients and be the patient's advocate because that's some of it's old science. Sorry. I would like to get... I see your face. (laughs) I would like to get sponsorship for the daily rant like that'll be the segment <laughs> um can we talk about our argument what argument uh over our Maybe, presentation do we do we have to i, I mean we can saying, i just i hate proving you wrong all the time in, in public and i feel like it's embarrassing for wrong? you i mean pretty much every single step of the way i just oh wow well, uh, I wish we did record that argument now so that we can wait like which okay which specific part because I feel like we've argued about the lots of things about what comes I think first what, our, what we came to the conclusion is you and I have terrible communication and you were saying one thing and I was asking for another and we were probably saying very close to the same thing. Hmm. But the way mm-hmm. you were working and the way I was working were not meshing very well. Can I, can I tell you in more retrospect what I think happened? It, yeah, what? terrible communication, all that stuff's true. I think that both of us think a little bit like one or two steps ahead of the other person's actual words. And so when you were saying the things that you were saying, I'm like, okay, well, then that makes it go here, here, and here. And you weren't going here, here, and here with it. I just took it further than it, you meant it. And so if I would have just shut up and listened to you, like I've been like, oh yeah, no, that totally makes sense. We could do it that way. But again, our ba- communication yeah. sucks. Ba- basically, like everyone needs to know, like we really do know how to put on a presentation, but that in the in the preparation of it, like I like to just kind of spitball. I, I like I like people to ask questions. I like let's you know not have everything nailed down and whatever. And Michelle's a little bit more professional about it. Well, or anal, every kind of about I mean, it. Like, yeah, one of the, whatevs. That's fine. <laughs> Call but, it whatever it is, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you know? So I had a Red Bull before the before we went on. Yep, I got such I heard a splitting the very distinct headache. Sound. Oh. Afterwards, really? I'm not. Yeah, I, I don't know if I've told you this. I haven't really been drinking very much lately. Oh, so there. no, I'm going back on it. Don't worry. I don't don't freak out about it but i got a really bad headache from it i'm like oh, i just can't be doing this anymore like i'm that's like my hangover like i just it's as close as i'm gonna get to a, <laughs> to a hangover is red bull so and that sucks i sure yeah do. yeah um oh, glad yeah, you're so not drinking that much anymore i know i gotta i gotta 
uh, temper it down a little bit. I was listening to a podcast this week uh, called The Nerdist. It's one of my favorite ones. And um, they were talking, Chris Hardwick, he's got to be probably mid 40s or so. And he's just talking about how he decided to like finally start taking care of himself in his 30s because he's, he's being an alcoholic and all sorts of stuff. I'm like, oh yeah, I'm I'm in my 30s. Maybe I should start maybe maybe not drinking things that are gonna the, make my heart the explode. Side of life. Yeah, we'll see. We'll yeah. see. Um, this week's episode has a really good interview. So what's so funny is that you and I, it's kind of, we do always run in separate circles. We always say that, but yeah. um, I met Kathy completely separate of you before. Yeah. It, but you know her because she's up in your neck of the woods. I don't know her. That well, I do. I know her now. I never met her before. I never. But, I knew of her. Right, and I but knew you of asked her, her to come on the podcast. Did was yes. it me that did that? Oh, <laughs> yes, that was you. Oh, oh. my god, oh, man, what but a good I, get! Good she, job, Andrew. Like you're just like pulling in the power speakers. I love it. Good job, she's Andrew. Great. She is oh. amazing. I would have I love her. died to have her as my teacher in hygiene school. I bet her I know. students are incredible. I oh I'm sure I just hope that they can appreciate her. You I know, hope for, so too. I did. I don't know yes. if they quite do, but because um, no one ever really appreciates their teacher, and like we talked about the last few episodes, like no one appreciates you in your hometown kind of thing. Yeah. Like I really, I just, I really, I don't know. I hope they treat her with the respect that she deserves. But gosh, she was yeah. good, wasn't she? She's so good, and she's so sweet. Just the salt of the earth, human that I was. She like knows to a lot about a lot of things. Time. She does. A lot. She is one of those lifelong learners that we strive to be. Like she's hmm. that she's there, and yeah, just her knowledge and who she's learned all of these things from, and how ahead of the game she is. Like amazing. So Kathy Bassett is our guest. Uh, we are again at RDH under one roof. You'll hear that again, again and again For and another again. Ten episodes, I think. Yeah, but enjoy this episode or interview with Kathy Bassett. Hey, Michelle. Yeah? It's time for the interview. Oh, but I had something else to say. We need to let the experts talk now. Fine. Do you want to leave this in and oh, you tell the world who we're talking say, about? Otherwise, we're gonna, so, we, we can veer off here so really before fast. We do, Kathy, let's, let's say this. Michelle, hmm. how many awesome people do you know from Washington State? I know, most of them are all from Washington. Like, seriously. She came back from that conference <laughs> and she's like, like I'm impressed. I, I get it now. Oh. Was, I brag about us all the time about how awesome we are. <laughs> But like this podcast goes out like internationally, right? So I'm trying yeah. to be like too braggadocious, but well, it's, it's like the Wild West when you, when you think of moving across, you know, literally go back to the Wild West, move across the country, the last frontiers, <laughs> and that's kind of what this area is. So kind of thinking of the term maverick, you know, yeah. a lot of people kind of ended up there for a lifestyle and attitude, and there's a lot of mavericks up yeah. there in all sorts of you know industries and things. And I think yeah. the value to us is that's been able to continue. Yeah. So people aren't afraid to try new things, and they aren't afraid to let go of things. So, yeah. you That's know, it's hygiene. Uh, we've gotten to do a lot. Yeah. We, it's like we just don't, we do it. We don't wait around a lot to find out. We just kind of yeah. move just forward and, well, and show I that we can. What I learned up there when I was there is like, I, I didn't have to go into such detail. I'm like, oh, I don't know, this, this, and this. And they're like, oh, yeah, that makes sense. I'm like, but do you, wait, no, and I'm going to explain the rest of it. And they're like, no, I get it. Like, really? Really? Really. You good? And they're going, please, go on to the next cool thing, you know. Or you're showing them something, and they're like, that's what I've been needing. That's it. Versus me going, let me show you all the different ways. Like, no, got it. I got it. This is what I've been looking for. You're just, you're uh, a solution to an issue that I knew I was having. I just hadn't found it yet. And so I was like, God, this was... Easy. Easy. That was yeah. super easy. So yeah. I will say. Well, and willing to try new stuff. That, yes. that is willing to try exactly. new stuff. Exactly. And ask really good questions. Not mm -hmm. just like, if, even though I want sometimes you to take it with a grain of salt. Like, trust me, I've been using it for 10 years. It's good. But you're like, well, tell me these things. Tell me this. And I'm like, that's the schools. Good <laughs> that's what I, it's, it's, that's the, what it's, I say. it's the schools. Mm -hmm. It's absolutely the school. And we can like, get into the whole, a whole nother thing. And I'm <laughs> sure you're a little bit partial to the schools in Washington having an affiliation there. But so the voice that you guys are listening to right now <laughs> is one of the greats from Washington State, Kathy Bassett. I'm sure you've heard her name. If you haven't, I'm going to have her introduce herself a little bit. Tell us the background because 
the funny thing is we're from the same state. I just actually met you for the first time today. Well, we probably used to live within about 10 minutes of each we're other. Isn't that crazy? crazy? We, we, we truly to did. Chicago to see each other. And, yeah. Yeah. Um, so tell us a little bit about your, your journey as a, as a hygienist. Um, the origin of my journey is my dad was a dentist, and he mm. practiced till he was 78 years old. And he had a dental hygienist named Judy Bright, who'd graduated from Yakima, nice. your alma mater. <laughs> And, you know, and I was, you know, in after school helping to clean, and I just kind of liked what she did. And so I just kind of would hang out watching Judy. (laughs) And then I'd go, well, this is cool. This is fun, and teeth are cute. And it just kind of, you know, progressed. And then you got into hygiene school and survived hygiene school. Survived is the exact word I would use. Yeah. And uh, then about eight years into my career, I went down the ergonomic tube. And I just, my body fell apart, and I got severely injured. And I literally spent two years in rehab. Um, I lost nearly all function of my right arm for about two years and had surgery and physical therapy and then eight hours a day hygiene just wasn't going to be available and an opportunity to be move into teaching came up and I guess the clearest thing I can say is never in my life could I ever imagine the people I'd meet and things I've gotten to do Mm -hmm. and it's kind of one of those things where you know the universe kind of kicked me off one bus but apparently I got back on the right bus Mm -hmm. because just like I said I've just I could never have imagined the things I've gotten to do and the depth I've gotten to go and how excited you can get and then you get together with the other people that are excited Mm -hmm. and then they kind of adopt you and you know you just grow and grow and I just have been truly blessed in the people who've come on my path or pulled me onto theirs and um, can't imagine being somewhere else, you know, and clearly had opportunity to get completely off, you know, the dental hygiene track. And it's yeah. just like, no, it has connections and foundations and, mm-hmm. um, you know, and even, you know, so it's, you know, ended up, I got my bachelor's degree at Eastern Washington University. So mm-hmm. started with a bachelor's and then around the time after I got hurt and went and got a master's in case I was going to go somewhere else or do something else, sure. ended up back at, mm-hmm. you know, dental hygiene, <laughs> got into education and then over the last four years, I've started going back. So now I've got my myofunctional therapy mm-hmm. training, and I've got my breathing retraining, my Butenko training, mm-hmm. and I've mm-hmm. got my training in sleep medicine. Mm-hmm. And pulling that all together, and like you were saying, people go, oh, yeah, I get it. Oh, I see. That solves yes. the problem. And as hygienists, we've seen all this stuff all these years, and you walk away from your exam and go, did you see that peculiar uvula? Mm-hmm. Did you watch how when they did this and this twitch and that twitch? Yeah. And, well, we didn't know they meant something. And right. so that's been the excitement about doing the sleep and myo functional therapy is oh my gosh they have names they have relevance it yeah. isn't just the parade of odd tongue tricks you know right. it's it's really something mm-hmm. and we can name it so just to be like you know nearly 40 years <laughs> in in my career I go that's what i've been seeing yeah it's like finally somebody mm-hmm. told me what this is and why it is mm-hmm. and now i need to make sure when i see that that I, you know, I'm active in getting that patient redirected. So right. You kind of watch that whole spectrum, and then anesthesia mm-hmm. kind of popped in the middle of that, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah. So I just want to throw in, like, this little, is it a little digression, but because then we'll get to the anesthesia. But Joy has been on the podcast, so mm-hmm. if you don't know the full ins and outs of myothera- myofunctional therapy, you need to go back to that podcast. Um, you, I was taking your course, um, and then... I was actually listening to Trisha O'Hare's through Spear, I think it was, and then I went to Uganda for my mission trip. There is not a single person that doesn't have a third molar that comes in perfectly or, like, the biggest, beautiful arches. Broadest palette you've ever seen. Ever seen. seen. And I I remember telling Daniel um, Lopez, who was on the trip with me, and I was like, they are literally poster childs for epigenetics or, like, what we are doing with our bottles and thumb sucking and all those things like they're breastfed kids from day one there's not an option for anything else and i'm like i can't it's so crazy to actually see when you a con- change and you contrast that in new zealand and australia to the aboriginal communities mm. 
where they can their diet has changed rapidly. So you can see that within two to three generations. So, you know, grandparent to grandchild, you know, with the epigenetics, mm-hmm. we're seeing it that fast. That I quickly. think Kevin Boyd, you know, had talked about that in one of his discussions. But that same thing is they can go back and the grandparent can have that healthy form and the grandchild with two generations off of changes in their diet Mm -hmm. is completely undermine their skeletal growth and their oral function and it's frightening and the other thing that i after taking all of y'all's courses has uh, i know thank you for pointing that out i loved it though it was good all y'all's all (laughs) y'all's all of y'all yeah that's not gonna be the last time you hear that either (laughs) Um, yeah, that could be the top of the, the, the title for this one. I was going <laughs> to title it Teeth Are Cute. Cause teeth Are Cute. <laughs> no, all y'all's pretty good, too, though. <laughs> all y'all's teeth are we cute. We don't care about her, though. <laughs> um, the thing, you know, as hygienists, when we start, we, like, start looking at people's teeth and their smiles and things like that. After taking y'all's courses, I look at people's mouths and their lips coming together. And I was watching somebody at the gym. I was on, like, the stair climber. And this kid probably was, like, 17. And just full mouth, like, Open mouth, mouth posture, never closed. Posture. His lips never touched. And I was like, oh, I bet that kid's got some, some myofunctional things happening there. But it's like, once you start to see it, and, like, each course that I've taken with you guys has been a little building upon that. And it's like, now you can't take it back. Well, it's interesting because in the United States... We are viewed from other countries as putting such a strong focus on aesthetics. Mm -hmm. And then you go to other countries and kind of, you know, there'll be a a perception of, you know, none of them ever have straight teeth. So we have valued that. But just choices were made along the way that by chasing aesthetics, things are being altered in a way that compromised function. Mm -hmm. So when we didn't get form that supported our natural function, we just got form that was now considered pretty. Mm -hmm. People are losing that original anatomical structure that supports things that I think are really important, like (laughs) air, (laughs) breathing, (laughs) breathing, speaking. Even the simplicity of if you don't chew, chewing stimulates thirst so you can become dehydrated while you're consuming liquids and not chewing and it's not stimulating you know saliva and stimulating that drive for thirst in in like in joy's presentation this morning you know joy molars is she had this great picture of the baby food aisle Mm -hmm. nothing makes me crazier than suck tubes of applesauce give them the apple please chew the food and it's a little scary what marketing and so it's food like changes and, and simplicity convenience that has now changed our, us changed health mm-hmm. and could end up you know compromising generations of young folks today until we get that redirected it's scary it is scary Some scary times and now, but now everyone's got sleep apnea, and they just assumed that it was because they weren't, like, documenting it or finding it or diagnosing it. But the reality is it's probably because we created a we created lot more it. sleep apnea issues. Well, we clearly have, and I think yeah. my generation, it was like, I just turned 60, and I'm surprised I'm saying that out loud. But I did. I just turned 60. Good for you. Hey. Um, but my generation, we had four by extractions. Mm-hmm. So we all got shrunk right off yep. the bat. And then our third molar's out. And the equivalent of that is putting a size 32 tongue in a size 24 garage. <laughs> you know, where's your tongue going to go? And, you know, that's one of the things is when we look at the soft tissues that y- you're born with certain, you know, configurations, dynamics, mm-hmm. but then you change structure, where's it going to go? Down your throat. Down your throat. <laughs> 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 well, and unfortunately, the hu- humans are the only species that can choke to death on their own tongue. Really? Yep. Never you thought about that. You are a vast encyclopedia of knowledge. With I know. They need facts. a game show for this. this it's like, like, you know. really do. Cocktail conversation. <laughs> like, hey, did you know? <laughs> you could choke oh what stuffed away in your pigeonhole. <laughs> Jeez, that's awesome. I know. I love those little random facts. Well, like, I hope it's not hey. useless information. People, no. A lot of people say, I know lots of useless stuff. I, no, go, I, don't I think know it's lots useless. of useful, but you have to understand what it applies to to actually think it is useful. Yeah. Find the context Absolutely. for it. Yeah. 
Mm-hmm. Huge change ups, huge change ups. Absolutely. What you got there, Mike? <laughs> <laughs> so. Uh, sorry, I'm going to interrupt the podcast okay. for a special for announcement. <laughs> um, do you know my brother, Mike? Kathy? Uh, no, Kathy, I is, don't. He's a hygienist. She's Olympia. Yes, I know. I know. Oh, you know, so I know all her. about you. you know oh, I was going to say, I know nothing about you. That's what uh, we do. We so people. we're at the wrong meetings. Yeah, so. Or we're I going on different nights. hired two of your most recent graduates. Who'd you hire? Uh, it depends on if they're good. Yeah. <laughs> tell us. No, who uh, tell Yeah, I love and, uh, at, at, at. Yes. Yes. And then, yes. Yeah. I just had dinner with last week. Oh. I adore her. Yeah. I want her to help me teach my medical emergencies class. Mm. Yeah, she's, she's an a, EMT. She's an EMT. So EMT. That would be Perfect. Fun. And so we've been, well, I had her all lined up and then her husband scheduled an impromptu surprise trip and they're Aww. leaving on the day I wanted her. And I go, oh. good on your husband. And I hate him. Yeah, you know? no, I'm really <laughs> upset with your husband doing really, really nice things for you. I really wanted to drills. Okay. Jumping back in. Not that people know that we've been gone because it's a podcast. We're going to edit all that other crap out. So, <laughs> I do want to circle back to education, though. Okay. So, you mentioned that because of the injuries and things, you had to you had to kind of alter your career path. So mm-hmm. then you started going to education. First of all, how did you find out about an opening? Because I feel like even now, I never hear about the openings at schools. And was it part time, full time? And then where did your career path take you from there? Um, interesting question. So while I was on disability and you know L and I disability and we had crafted a remediation plan and we chose education because we felt that that was something you know I could delve into so that's why I started working in my master's because I figured you know likely I would need one at some point Mm -hmm. and it made sense so I actually did a master's in education with an emphasis on computers and education which was, you know, really fun and gave me a strong technology background. So during the last year I was working on that or kind of starting it simultaneously, I ended up actually volunteering at Pierce College. And so I worked two years in clinics and labs as a volunteer back to industry Um, intern, if you will. And then after two years of being there, a full-time position opened up. And so I thought, well, this is a good exercise in creating a resume and interviewing. (laughs) And I've, you know, done a little bit of teaching with these folks. And I had every expectation the person um, that was in a part-time, full-time capacity for this tenure track job would be maintained. So I applied and I interviewed, and I came back down to the director's office, and I kind of said, well, wow, that was an interesting interview. And I go, what am I going to do if they actually offer it to me? <laughs> and Sharon Golightly, my director, I will never forget her, leaning back in her chair, throwing papers over her shoulder and saying, well, you better figure that out pretty quick. <laughs> and then it was like, they might actually offer this to me. So within a short period of time, I was offered a full-time tenure-track wow. job. Wow. So I stepped in on day one with 120% load as wow. the first-year lead and taught in radiology. I taught preventive. I taught fundamentals. I taught in restorative clinic and lab. I taught in first-year clinic, mm-hmm. second-year mm-hmm. clinic, mm-hmm. and it's all a big blur. Wow. And then I've been there going on this is i'm in my 30th year wow and i'm officially his only one instructor with more seniority in the entire pierce college system than me (laughs) but i want to emphasize i'm not the oldest i've just been there the longest (laughs) (laughs) they're almost the longest so it's been an interesting like and that was one of the things i kind of commented earlier is really interesting opportunities have come and then once I got there again you start meeting people and I never feel like I've really said oh I want that and I've put it on my bullseye and gone after it it's just really unique opportunities have presented and you have to go why or why not Mm -hmm. and now or not now and so when you say why not Mm -hmm. and now you can end up in places you never can see of before. And I think that's, you know, been one of the the pivotal parts for me is not being afraid to say, well, why not? Well, not yeah. It might as well be now. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So true. So I think it's nice, and what I, I think we both appreciate, and probably what all your students, is that you have been doing this in the teaching side of it for so long but you're still progressive yes i, and I, I appreciate think that, that that's such a 
missing link in a lot of the school settings and the educational settings of dental hygiene is that there's a lot of complacency. I teach it this way. This is how I teach it. I'm like, well, that's not. That's a little antiquated. Like, I can't change my curriculum. I have these slides. Like, this is what it is. And it's so detrimental to the the, the hygiene student. This pertinent part of that where you have to get brave. So I started following the principles of flipped classroom mm. about five or six years ago. And the data clearly shows if you stop lecturing, students do better. So I haven't done a traditional lecture in going on six years. So wait, what's, yeah. what's the concept of flipped? flipped classroom? So what you can acquire in a classroom and what you can study at home are two very different things. So it's a waste of your brain power and a waste of my time for me to stand up and just rephrase in different language exactly what you could have read at home. <laughs> the book. And then if I'm going to do that, you're not going to read it. Right. And then you're not getting a you're not getting a two off. You're not getting read me, hear me, which helps it anchor in. And if you're only relying on hear me, okay, hearing a message is the the lowest means of acquiring information that exists. So flipped classroom changes the relationship. So when you come to class, it's about let's touch it, feel it, do it, you know, make it much more active. Mm -hmm. Um, So in the traditional sense, you don't come to my two-hour class and listen to me talk for two hours. Mm, I I might talk for 10 minutes here, 10 minutes here, maybe a little more complex. I might spend a little bit more time, but there's always something you're doing um, and have to interact with each other. So if you hear it, and it's also based on the work of John Medina out of Seattle, the Brain Rules book, and it looks at what the brain can acquire, what the intervals are for you to actually Mm -hmm. hear it. So if I want you to hear something, I'm going to say it, And then within about 30 seconds, I'm going to say it again in some other way because your brain needed two of them. Then ideally, if I can tell you that again in about two hours, (laughs) then that sequence is going to anchor it in your brain at a biological level. But if I just stand up and jabber at you, I've wasted your time. I'm hyperventilating (laughs) because I'm talking through my mouth, you know. (laughs) So (laughs) changing the relationship and getting students to understand the power of their own ability to study. Mm-hmm. They hated it first, <laughs> you know, and you have to be brave. You have to be willing to let people be resistant mm-hmm. because that's not what everybody else did. And it's like, okay, but here was your A and P class you took as a prerequisite, and now we're in head and neck anatomy. Tell me what you remember. Mm-hmm. Yeah. If you remember 2% and I needed you to remember about 80%, waste for me right Right. so it's for you too if i can get you to leave my class taking 80 percent with you to somebody else's class Mm -hmm. now i've helped you and i've helped them and now we're building yes and moving you forward so it's yeah like that that so we play with play-doh it's like going to monty sore school for adults (laughs) (laughs) what do you do with play-doh we build teeth and uh-huh. we build embryos. We do embryonic wow. folding out of yeah. play and dough, and we build the whole teeth rather than drawing or carving. Mm-hmm. We actually it. craft the entire mouth. Oh, out of so the you, you know, you have to figure out good. where's the height of contour. You got a tooth next to you. You have to like have a conversation mm-hmm. with your neighbor tooth yeah. to figure out how this all fits together and yeah, crown root ratios and. You know, put it in a decision making and realizing associations to adjacent teeth by having conversations with other people. Mm-hmm. How do you think that you guys would feel if I came and I was a student at your school? Can we come again? Come again. <laughs> come again. I know that's been one of the things that's been fun when we do our continued education classes. So twice a year, um, we have a class, and we'll do anesthesia in the spring, and then we'll do restorative. And it's for folks coming into the state you right, know, that, right. that didn't get it in school. Yeah. And it's rewarding when they'll say that. They go, I wish I'd come here. Yeah. But you have to look back that when you're in the intensity of hygiene, it's like, which one of us wouldn't say, I survived hygiene school. I can do anything. Right. Yeah. And once you get through that, my master's was way easier than my hygiene. <laughs> and I've got an additional graduate certificate that was way easier than my yeah. hygiene. <laughs> I know. And so I just feel like you will learn an approach to life and information and moving things forward, being advocates for others in that process that was far more valuable than 
the little bits of facts mm-hmm. that you apply, mm-hmm. it's, there's a way bigger picture than what was actually in the book. I might have missed this earlier, but what is your current role? I am... So, so I started as first-year lead, and so now I am a you know, full-time tenured professor, and I teach head and neck anatomy, histo and embryology, dental anatomy. I have the privilege of teaching two quarters of vocal anesthesia, so I get basic anesthesia, and then we could wait two quarters and do an advanced techniques, so they get... You know, a little bit more when they've had some experience and are really ready for it. I teach. I'm a co-lead and teach in the restorative, second-year restorative clinic. And then I have another little label that's kind of about um, overseeing policy and procedures that moves through. So I have mm-hmm. a risk management liaison. So I do infection control, HIPAA, mm-hmm. and, um, and some things that are about you know keeping the flow and forms and policies and procedures. Just a little bit of everything, wow. it sounds like. Yeah. A lot. Seriously. A lot. Which has happened to, you know, educa- every educator across the country will tell you their plate is full. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And that's just the way it is. It's, that's the truth, though. Mm-hmm. Did you want me to tell you what the reputation of Pierce is around the state from one well, of the houses in the school? If it's one I'd like. I mean, I think, it, I think, they, think, I think they think it's tough. Um, it is the toughest program it, I in the state. Don't doubt it. Um, from again, this is just reputation, anecdotal. Mm-hmm. I, I have no evidence to prove it, which I know Michelle loves science and evidence, but mm-hmm. it's all but anecdotal. Still, no. It is the best program, from what I understand, and everyone wants to get in, and not very many people can. Get is it in. associates <laughs> or bachelors? We are now a bachelors. Um, this this past June, we gave our first baccalaureate certificates. And the absolute, I mean, I have goosebumps even just saying that to you. I'm just like, <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, you look at any hygiene program across the state, and particularly in Washington. Yes. You did baccalaureate's curriculum. Yes, we did. Talk about intensity. And we've kind of laughed about surviving hygiene mm-hmm. school. Okay, there's, ac- there's academic rigor in hygiene school. And it took you two plus two, two years of prerequisites, two years in the program to get in. You already did a baccalaureate. Yes. So most of the hygiene schools across the country are doing baccalaureate already so to finally be at a point where our institution got that and we had an opportunity and our director led in building that curriculum and getting all the paperwork and all the stamps of approval so that we could do this Mm -hmm. and then we have some other programs on campus now also so we have some additional baccalaureate degrees within a two-year institution Mm -hmm. as they've looked at the nature of these programs so all of our program, all of our degrees now are baccalaureates, and that's pretty much the drive think, in Washington. Uh, I, I think, think within all of them, all of them are going to within at least a couple more years, probably mm-hmm. all but one that's mm-hmm. not a state based school will be baccalaureate, mm-hmm. and that's pretty exciting when you that's think of the great, future. I program. wish super exciting. It's uh, what my wish is for mm-hmm. hygiene programs is to mm-hmm. all be a four year degree, and it's you know clearly in the interest in of interest and. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Lots of folks are pushing and working in that direction. I hope so. So here's the thing. I know we've had a lot we want to get to. We can choose probably either one or the other. You want to do myofunctional therapy or do you want to do local anesthesia? Well, we haven't we're, had local anesthesia on the podcast. We're going to have to have so. her come back. Is it okay if you come back and do another one with us sometime? <laughs> well, and, and for me, the myofunctional therapy is the newer piece. Mm-hmm. Like I yeah. just did my first assessment last week. So I'm, so I'm <laughs> actually getting my first myofunctional Patient, so nice. I have a couple, and exploring ways to actually engage in that, um, yeah. you know, externally. So I'm just excited That's about awesome. that. <laughs> so, so it gives me goosebumps too. Um, but obviously, I'm sort of here at under one row for anesthesia, for anesthesia and yeah. you know, and I'm also involved at the University of Washington. So I also have an adjunct professor appointment at the University of Washington Dental School, and then I've been invited in. So on the days that they do local anesthesia lab, I get to participate and help with the dental students learning their anesthesia now as well. What does the dental student's anesthesia curriculum look like compared to the hygiene program? Across the country, <laughs> it's very different. It's actually. very different, and I'm really pleased to say that Washington State has taken a real look at that, and they've even done some restructuring, so um, to have you know more focus. So, the dental students have two labs. One lab where they get in is 
two or three maxillary injections, one lab where they get in two or three mandibular injections on a peer-to-peer basis. Mm -hmm. And then from then out, it will be on their different rotations in their different departments and in the role of clinical care. So depending on what the nature of their operative obligations are, where the hygienists have probably 10 to 15 IAs and PSAs and MSAs before they're even allowed to graduate. So, you know, high numbers. We track. We know exactly how many they gave. Mm -hmm. Because of the nature of the program, we have the manpower and the time to be one-on-one. So everybody can have somebody Mm -hmm. right there mentoring. When you give an injection Mm -hmm. later, you have a faculty right there mentoring. So you get you know, a year to 18 months of right over your shoulder, somebody there coaching in your ear guidance and significantly more repetitions than is the standard curriculum in most dental schools. I would have to say that in areas where it was difficult for dentists to agree to that licensure change, I can appreciate the concern if I had been taught in the same way many of them had been taught. Mm. Sure. Okay. Absolutely. Because they don't know what all the guidance that we have. And if I was taught in the same way that many dentists have told me that they learned, then I kind of get it. Yeah. And so part of it is educating them on exactly the question. What is our curriculum? And we do, in fact, get more hours Mm -hmm. and more direct guidance and one-on-one guidance than the typical dentists get. I think most dentists think we're trained in a garage or something. Like that well, we, I'm not sure. We just don't even get, like, any kind no. of appropriate. She's from but South Carolina, again, Carolina, but again, though, so yeah. and then, state to state. Yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'll let you go there on your own, y'all. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so she's yeah. The, one of the infiltrations in only states. It's, yeah. So it's, it mm-hmm. is a little bit different. Yep, it is, and it sucks. But it does. Even though I did all infiltrations for all the surgeries that we did in Imperio office. You can you can successfully anesthetize nearly everything you need, and particularly yeah. for hygiene, with that. My bias on it is I wish you could do it with fewer penetrations. Exactly. Right. And at the end of Most the day. Most people were sedated, so it didn't matter. Right. Anyway. Yeah, so, but for the lie, the patient that's very aware and awake, it, you're right, it's not. And it, yeah, at the end of the appointment, cool. it's still cumulatively yes. a certain volume of drug. Mm-hmm. Right. But if you respect, use the smallest quantity you can right. and in the most effective manner with the fewest teach. penetrations, now we've got you know, good patient care. Yeah. And, Which and, is definitely and yes. what we teach because we understand like that is we are limited, but we want to make sure that mm-hmm. the patients are taken care of with well, and, out and dosing the thing, them with so Well, the other thing too is, you know, what would be really interesting is in your state, that law would say you aren't capable of doing something more difficult. In states that aren't allowed to do it at all, you aren't capable or smart enough to do it but if you just get in your car and drive across state lines your iq automatically goes up and you're you know so so why is it their teeth was different you're magically smarter in another state their jaws their jaws were different i just assumed (laughs) the people that lived in certain states had just different anatomy and i couldn't figure it out and the same thing going the other way if i left washington and went to some other select Mm -hmm. states does that mean i all of a sudden am no longer an expert in local anesthesia you get dumber is what happens yeah, no, and, yeah. like, <laughs> you know, and to be honest that that has impacted my life because at one point i had an opportunity to be in a long-term relationship that would have taken me to the east coast mm-hmm. and it came down to i can't you know you could like, you can yeah. do what you do on the west coast in the same manner if i come here it's going to be very different and it's going to have me step away from the depth of my training and yeah. i stayed yeah. on the west coast yeah. it was that important yeah well you put a lot of effort and time into that <laughs> what are some of the the obstacles or the the challenges that many people come across at whether they're students or even people that have been doing it for a while and getting people the, the depth of anesthesia that they need one of the things that for me in the last few years is through a number of folks i've had opportunity you know to work with in, in dentistry in particular is 
it really is location, location, location. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, it's the little cliche term in real Mm -hmm. estate, but it's the same. So the closer you put an appropriate quantity of drug to the nerves you need, the more successful you're likely to be. So one of the things we're talking about the most right now is um, looking at the anatomy that may be using a long needle to do an inferior alveolar block is not necessary. And there are many people across the country on a daily basis successfully giving IAs with short needles. And there's an anatomical basis for it. So if we have made making our initial penetration too low, then we, quite frankly, are below the foramen. The mandibular right. foramen is higher than we really understood or grasped onto. And then we go three-fourths of the length of a long needle till we make contact with bone, and the patient's reclined backwards. Mm. Can you conceive that 20% of the time you're putting the drug below and behind the foramen? Mm-hmm. And then you sit them up. Well, if the, if the drug's already below and behind the foramen, gravity's not going to help you put it anywhere. Right. You know, it's like hurting so you kittens. Turn your patient upside down, though, right? That That's might all, work. Turn them help. upside down. Mm-hmm. Yeah, gravity boots would probably be the better way to the, do that. Because they can all lean back all the way. Yeah. Yeah. No problem. I never so. have anybody that says, don't lean me back farther. They're don't actually like, back could back. you put me on my head? I'd, I'd like to be on my head. Yeah, that's how I'd I like sleep, to, I look a little pale today. I'd like to be on my head. <laughs> you know, but can we do the paradigm shift? So there's the thing is is do we always have to do only what we learned? And so here's my challenge to that is how much of what you do every day in hygiene did you honestly learn in school? And how much have you evolved Mm -hmm. after you left school? I know infinitely more that I've acquired after Mm -hmm. than I did while I was in school. So why is it any different with local anesthesia? Right. And... Once you just, you know, get real about, you know, the anatomy, that really is where your bones are. And, you know, Mm -hmm. that really is, you know, with a little bit of variance where the nerves are. And so don't cling to old dogma because it was relevant for the nature of how they could study it when it was evolved. And these blocks evolved in like the 1800s, you know. Have you ever seen the show The Nick? No. Have you ever seen that show? Mm. I wish I knew what channel it was on. But it was it's based on the East Coast, and it was about the Knickerbocker Hotel. Oh. And this whole thing is like the history of medicine. Mm-hmm. And there's this one scene where they're doing this surgery, and they called it the theater, and the folks would come in and sure. sit like oh, in a yeah. theater, mm-hmm. and they'd watch the surgery, and they'd tell what was going on. And the doctor stops to introduce Dr. Halstead in the audience. So I'm going, I know who he is! Because oh. Halstead's considered one of the fathers of the IA block. We talked about that on one of our Scaling the Webs. So the block that we give, you know, we call it the Halstead. Mm -hmm. It's sort of the the conventional one most of us, you know, Mm -hmm. learned. And, like, they had typhoid Mary, you know, a case about that. But I was just like, I know, I know who that is. (laughs) (laughs) But, you know, but to move on beyond that. And so we need to evolve from what they knew then and what we know now in looking at you know, some great you know research that's out there that's replicated mm-hmm. you know where is that foramen well the foramen is halfway between the anterior border and the posterior border of the ramus at its narrowest aspect it's not almost to the back mm-hmm. it's halfway over and over and over and over which puts it at between 12 to, to 19 millimeters okay long needles they're 32 mm-hmm. half the length of a long needle will get you there mm-hmm. And usually we're going, you know, two-thirds to three-fourths mm-hmm. the length. Mm-hmm. And now we're, bye. Past We've it. gone right past <laughs> it. So, like you say, so it gets to be, no, I always do that because that is what I was taught. In school, yeah. And that was the convention, like you were mm-hmm. saying, you know, earlier, is we cling to what we all originally learned. You get out in dentistry and you aren't doing yeah. what you left school doing so do you advocate then for using a short and just adjusting your landmarks a little bit or do you do you, gout gatesy i don't you don't adjust your landmarks at all for it it's 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 the same pathway if you do anything on a routine basis move your penetration site more superior because that foramen in 94 percent of the population 
that foramen is 15 millimeters above the occlusal table. That's not where we were taught Whoa. to go. We no. were taught to be below that. So move your penetration site up. The other thing is remember that the pterygomandibular effet, it's flexible. It's soft tissue. Mm -hmm. So think of it like a clothesline with a blanket hanging over it or something. When you first penetrate the needle tip, then just gently deflect the refet towards the tongue medially. That moves you off the bone. There goes premature contact. You can eliminate premature contact by deflecting that refet as little as 2 millimeters. Then you go higher. So we're getting up to that 94% of evidence that the frame is higher Mm -hmm. and go about four millimeters from the hub of a short needle it's reproducible it's measurable and that's closer to where the frame actually is with the nerve entering into it than where we've been taught to put it and done it for years and people across the country who've adopted it it's almost like they're embarrassed to say that's what they do (laughs) and it works beautifully they'll all tell you i routinely get anesthesia my patients are comfortable i'm not making premature contact with bone that causes discomfort okay well that's a good thing too so now just add one more less (laughs) likely to make contact less discomfort um you know likely to get numb anatomically it matches up all good things And the reason we needed to make contact with bone on a deep penetration is not as much to tell us we were where the drug needed to go, but to tell us where the drug needed not to go. Mm. Because we don't want to go posterior into the parotid gland. Mm. So even after the course today, this morning, I had a woman come up, and she said, well, after my IA, I've had a situation where the patient's eye all of a sudden Mm -hmm. drooped, and they couldn't close their eye. And what was that? I go, well, that was the unesthetized facial facial nerve, Mm -hmm. and it's in the parotid gland. gland, So what that means is that your penetration, you were too parallel Mm -hmm. to the ramus and too deep. Mm. And you engaged in the space where the facial nerve mm. passed through. Well, let's stay out of there. Yeah. And that's what that deep contact with bone is. It lets you know, I am against the ramus. I'm not in that posterior tissue. Mm-hmm. And that was one of the safety checks with a deep penetration. Mm-hmm. So what if I don't need to get there at all because the needle can't? I've just added another positive. Mm-hmm. You see that on Facebook a lot, though, like when people talk about IAs, like dentists, I see it more often. Oh, yeah, and they yeah. lose their mind if you talk about a short needle. Yeah, well, I mean, I think a lot of them, too, aren't really compensating for a gauge either. Most people are thinking shorts, 30 gauge shorter. Uh, and, yeah, you know, and, they, they freak out about it. And honestly, that. there's there isn't any good reason to use a 30 gauge needle ever. So here's the right. discussion on that. You go wash your car, mm-hmm. and you turn on the hose. Okay, mm-hmm. how do you rinse your car? You know about putting your thumb yeah. over the end of the hose mm-hmm. so oh, yeah. you constrict the diameter mm-hmm. of the Spray opening to increase the pressure and the mm-hmm. force it exits. So when you use a 30-gauge needle and you're pressing with the same force and velocity you normally deposit, it is coming out more forcefully mm-hmm. and you actually have fluid dynamic trauma to the tissues. Mm-hmm. So 30-gauge needles, there's this perception because it's smaller it is less discomfort right. when there's repeated research that shows people can't tell the difference between oh, the needle really? gauges. Nice. But there's also a great article out of Japan where they were able to demonstrate when you have that really slow drip, 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 people didn't feel that. Mm. As soon as it got to be a burst exiting, yes. people can feel that. Mm-hmm. Well, if you don't think a 30 gauge with, you know, if you're doing less mm-hmm. than a minute in a 30 gauge, you're just blasting the fire hose yes. in there. Sure. Yeah. And my students like to do that, too. I'll so it's like, them. put oh, down the 30-gauge so needle. And that's what you've chosen. Yeah. Well, and the other thing is so deflection. You, yeah. If you're using a long 30, has anybody really thought about where the needle tip is when you start to deposit the drug? I've never actually heard the of The deeper 30. you go, it will deflect away from where the, bevel's, the bevel's facing mm-hmm. as much as 45 degrees. Really? Okay. Yeah, yeah. You may not be able to compensate. And depending on which side of fascia you're on... You might have drug completely on the other side of the fascia, and it can't penetrate through, you know, to access the nerve. Um, I have one last question because I'm sure you get this one a lot: lidocaine and septicaine for IAs, or four, let me say four percent for mandibular blocks. I should say that. <clears throat> there is clearly discussion in the literature 
that 4% drugs show a higher signal for um, paresthesias, but not to the extent that they are in any way medically inappropriate to use. And if you look at our body of literature, is 17 years, came into the market in 2000. But Europe and Canada have used this drug, particularly, you know, the Articane, for 20, 30 years, Mm -hmm. and very successfully so. And you are more likely to be struck by lightning (laughs) than you are to get a paresthesia. Wow. So (laughs) if I'm the person giving the drug... I'll take those odds, and sure. we use a lot of articaine, and 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 also it does not appear that these things are happening in the maxilla. It's fairly concentrated to the lingual nerve. There have been cases um, of other you know nerves, but also there are people who never received any drug at all that have paresthesias. Okay, that's physical trauma. Sure. So what if the mechanism really is, yes, there could be you know, a greater incidence when you have that higher concentration of drug, but how are you handling your needles and how are you handling your mm. drug? Are you doing them rapidly? Are you using 30-gauge needles? Have you traumatized the physical nerve sheath? And once you create that trauma, then is it possible to have it be more susceptible to a 4% drug? Mm-hmm. Um, it's easy for people to think if someone gets a paresthesia, the patient's going to sue and you're going to lose. That's not true. Patients are losing lawsuits because the evidence is not strong nice. that it's all about the drug. Mm-hmm. And we know in medicine and in dentistry, these things can occur. And at the end of the day, as a hygienist, I need to accept the guidance of the dentist who owns the practice, who is ultimately my supervisor. And you know, and I need to say that really clearly, is, is we do need to do that from a legal standpoint. And so if I have an employer that's not comfortable, I need to abide by their wishes in a true relationship of supervision. But I'm also lucky enough to work in environments where we're comfortable with what the data says, we're comfortable, um, but we also say, go slow, and you don't need as much. Yeah. You know, it's twice as many molecules of drug present than a 2% drug. So, you know, <laughs> you can use just one cartridge. You know, don't automatically say everybody gets two cartridges and I'm right. using Articane. So now we're back to the principle that use the smallest quantity possible in the best location to advance the anesthesia. And if we use that guidance and don't just start doubling up doses, then, mm-hmm. you know, we're we are acting prudently and the other thing about articaine is because it's not strictly metabolized in the liver now you have other people who have compromised issues that are going to be able to get the anesthesia they need correct and because we have a one to two hundred thousand concentration now for cardiac patients i can give you enough anesthesia to get you numb where i need to do and at the same time give you a 50 percent reduction in the vasoconstrictor right off the bat. So it's way easier to comply with cardiac doses Mm -hmm. or people with sensitivity to epinephrines um, to manage that with the 1 to 200. So articaine, 4%, 1 to 200,000, pretty great stuff. (laughs) Um, But if you're, you know, think about, am I going to use, how many cartridges am I going to use? You know, so you have to use good practices. And I don't have a problem with it in, in but I clearly respect those that have made the decision that it's not their comfort zone. Yeah. I need to let them have that. Yeah. And um, That's fair. It's fair, <laughs> yeah. But there are the folks that, you know, can benefit from the shorter half-life and mm-hmm. other factors about it. You know, it's like you can give one cartridge of Articane. It has a 15-minute half-life. Okay, if you take six to eight, within about an hour and a half to two hours, it's cleared the system. Okay, you take lidocaine, you're going to need eight to 12 hours to clear the system. So mm-hmm. for folks with certain kinds of medical compromise, there are some great discussions, a great article that's actually done, you know, by Dr. Malamad in looking at for pregnancy, too. So if you have somebody yeah. nursing, you know, let's, let's get drugs out of the body when we need to use them in mm-hmm. that period of right. time. Right. You have a mom that's nursing. If I can tell you that, if you know, you can go ahead and dispose of milk for this many hours and then your body will have cleared it and there you know there isn't going to be the metabolites dropping into the breast milk so if they Mm -hmm. have that concern so now i can by timing plan with patients and better 
accommodate different mm-hmm. medical conditions. That's a great point. It's really good. Yeah, really. There's some great considerations mm-hmm. that you think about. What else you All right. Well, I got a lot more, but it's been, I know. A, it's been an got... hour, so <laughs> we should probably wrap, We're wrap this up. They um, fly by. They do, really do. Yeah. Do you have, because I know you're teaching as well, but do you have like a lecture schedule that people can find or um, can people contact you in a certain way? Two or three different things. Um, you're always welcome to email me. And um, and initially, you know, through my, my school. So I'm at kbassett at pierce.ctc.edu, and that will find me at work. Um, we also have our textbook, Local Anesthesia for Dental Professionals. And what a lot of people don't realize is we also have a companion DVD of all the techniques that's oh. matched and paired to the book. And so if you're reaching out and want to buy it, you can buy it in a bundle through the publisher and get a significant discount on the DVD. So if you're wanting to try a new technique you haven't, we'll walk you through start right. to finish. Yeah. Um, also, I've got two YouTube videos with Dr. Michael Detola in California. Oh. And they're actually that was one of the funnest things I ever did. I went down to Newport Beach and spent a day with Dr. Detola at the um, Glidewell. Mm-hmm. Studio, and so we did a start to finish with the AMSA. We did a start to finish with the Gal Gates, and also the focus of those visits were about the use of the wand. So you'll get to see a discussion of the use of computer controlled anesthesia, C clad mm-hmm. anesthesia, and get the whole technique with the AMSA. And those you just like if you just go to Glidewell. Um, he just talked about this on his podcast. Yeah, oh, did he? He yeah. gave you a shout out. Yeah, he did. And oh, did he? Talked about um, that. And he said that something. He's talking about like Texas dentist and not wanting to. How they need to get with it. Yeah, <laughs> I said, I literally text him after that. I was like, I literally, I want to high five you. He after said that. he never like, heard of the AMSA before you got you told him and all this. And the Gal so. Gates, I think, right? Uh, maybe he'd, he'd yeah. done he'd done a Gal Gates before, but the AMSA was clearly it was, new, was new territory. He was yeah. like, "What kind of yeah. pretentious asshole?" <laughs> dentist. Dentist, uh, <laughs> like that. So yeah, I had a hygienist teach me, and you think that you're like so smart, you can't, a hygienist can't do that. Like, well, his comments are just hysterical on the hysterical. entry, and then or the patient for both the events. She was actually a recent graduate from either USC or UCLA Dental School, and and she kind of says the same thing. You know, when they say something like, "I." Oh, five hundred thousand dollars in student loans, and I never learned these, you know, yeah. these yeah. injections. Yeah, but yeah. Um, so, you know, you can get those <laughs> too just on YouTube, <laughs> and um, and then so, oh, I will be in this spring. I am in um, Nebraska, and I'm in Kansas in April, March and April. And then waiting for kind of final verification, I'll be at the California Dental Meeting in next September. Um, next week, I'm actually at the Saskatchewan Naturopathic Physicians <laughs> Conference, and which is really cool. And I'm That's actually funny. been invited to come and talk to a group of naturopaths about how can they be part of our team. And that's kind of more out of my myofunctional therapy mm-hmm, world. That was sort say. of how I wove into that and the Butenko that Breathing sense, Educators. Yeah. Um, I started in talking with their association. So I'm really looking forward to that. And that's a very different <laughs> program. And I get to go on herb walks with the elders and and, you know, so, cool. so like I said, it's I'm getting cool. on a whole, n- a whole nother bus, you know. <laughs> but again, you know, do, have, do we reach out? Who do we reach out to? Mm-hmm. And I think the naturopathic community, you know, is an area we need to think about. And they can be on our team in ways that we might not have supported them as mm-hmm. well, too. And Absolutely. there's some really great conversations available to all of us to start. Nice. Meet your local naturopath. Yeah. Very nice. And we'll see where that goes. So that was your work email. Is that the best email? That's the best email. Yeah. yeah. And then we kind Perfect. of filter from there. And then get the book. Get and then the watch book. the YouTubes. Watch the YouTubes. And then I'll be at the Washington State Dental Meeting again next year. Oh, good. I'm also, is it the symposium? So. Yeah. Long, well, at, at the long? Washington State Meeting. So at PNDC. Oh, the PNDC. PNDC. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I've been invited back to there for June. And then, Very nice. And then September will be California Dental Meeting. Awesome. Cool. Thank, Thank you. So much. You're welcome. I'm so glad that you I came. <laughs> well, we have to say this again that we we've come all the way to Chicago, Chicago. to meet people to meet that like yeah. live yeah. in my neighborhood. Mm-hmm. Almost yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> so I met you too. before Andrew met you. <laughs> well, this is like, well, I know so Michelle. Who's Andrew? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, but I do get that a lot, though. Actually, to be fair. So. <laughs> Who is Andrew? <laughs> well, now I know. Now I know. Oh, oh, well, thank you know. again. Thank you guys. It was fun. <laughs> Listeners, 
want to tell you a story. A story I found on the web, which makes this Scaling the Web with Andrew. This week for Scaling the Web with Andrew, um, a couple of things. One, you may or may not hear some honking and some screeching of tires. As I am driving, I am on the road, and look out, everybody. Um, okay, so there there have been some changes. Michelle and I have discussed doing some things that maybe a little bit different, and we really hope that you guys are going to be really supportive of this. One of the things that, um, that I wanted to really come across with the Scaling the Web segment was just getting information out to people for different topics and things that you may, maybe you saw on Facebook, maybe you didn't, maybe things that you're going to see in journals, maybe you wouldn't, maybe publications that had happened 10 years ago that you just don't see anymore that are silly or funny or whatever. And I feel like that, you know, they've been pretty okay. It just really wasn't, it didn't materialize. It didn't, it didn't end up being what I really wanted it to be. I'm not giving it, you know, it's not a knock. I just feel like there is a better way of doing it. And I have finally found the better way of doing it. And um, because of this new way, I've been able to aggregate a bunch of different articles from all sorts of publications that are more current and recent and funny. And so not necessarily funny, I mean, interesting. And thought provoking. And one of the articles, the one I was going to share today was about killer whales and what's kind of going on with them because of being in captivity and being bored and also displaying signs of aggressive behavior because they are anxious. And it's kind of a sad story, but it, there's a dental twist to it because when they're gnawing on the metal um, bars and things like that, they're causing fractures. They're, um, their teeth are getting so worn. Actually, you know what? I'm going to stop right now because I am still going to be using this. And that's part of the announcement that I wanted to kind of explain right now is I am actually going to start a new podcast that um, is a three-day-a-week podcast, basically scaling the web. I'm going to rename it. It's going to be something different. It's going to be branded maybe a little bit different as well. But I am collecting all of these articles and all these stories currently so that it can be uh, a Monday, Wednesday, Friday release. And it'll just be information. It won't be a lot of chit-chat or analysis. And maybe hopefully it'll reach the, the bigger audience, including hygienists, but also dentists and assistants and something that they can just listen to on their way to work on those few days. Um, something that's easily binge listening listenable, listen, whatever. Um, just something I really hope that, you know, everyone uh, appreciates maybe a little bit more than that effort. I think that ended up being scaling the web again. I don't mean to knock it. I just feel like it wasn't living up to the potential that I was, I envisioned for it. And therefore, Michelle and I are going to take that away. Also, you may have noticed that over the last few weeks, Michelle has done her story time with Michelle by herself. I've done my thing by myself. And um, it's just, we miss it. We miss working together and collaborating on, on both of our segments. And so we are going to bring that back where Michelle and I talk about um, whatever her story time with Michelle is going to be. So rather than... Um, talking about the article today. That's all I really want to tell you guys. Uh, wish us luck on this new thing. It's still, it's still a tell two hygienist produced thing. Um, it's still under our kind of our network that we're starting. Um, I think I'm going to probably be launching it here in the next couple of months and we'll keep you guys uh, abreast of kind of all the, the changes and things that, that are happening. But I do want to kind of backlog this one and, um, in addition, we are kind of shopping it around for sponsorship. If somebody wants to sponsor that as their podcast, that might happen too. They call it, they call it branded podcasting. So like eBay has a branded podcast that Gimlet produces. Gimlet is just like another podcasting company. Um, 
So doing something similar to that. Anyway, we'll keep you guys uh, in the loop. Thank you so much for the support. I really do appreciate all the feedback that we have gotten over um, the year or so that we've been doing the Scaling the Web segment. It's been phenomenal. It's been fun. But it's time to branch on. Branch out. Yeah, branch out. So thank you again. It's about that time. Grab your blanket and a glass of wine. It's story time with Michelle. So story time with Michelle is again in honor of our guest, Kathy Bassett. I don't normally do articles from magazines. Um, I usually try to stick to journals, like peer-reviewed journals, but Dimensions of Dental Hygiene has really good um, articles. And this is written by Kathy Bassett and Dr. Art DeMarco. And this is titled, Maximize the Benefits of Computer-Controlled Local Anesthesia Delivery. And I'm trying to find a date. Uh, looks like it's from 2016, July of 2016. So it says, the introduction of computer-controlled local anesthesia delivery, also known as CCLAD, has simplified pain management in the dental setting. Ensuring patient comfort is in integrity integral, excuse me, not only to treatment outcomes, but also in creating a positive dental experience for patients to support compliance and their return for follow-up care. CCLAD devices deliver local anesthetic drugs in a slow, controlled manner compared with traditional manual syringes. They help improve patient comfort during local anesthesia administration and can be especially helpful for patients with a fear of injections, as the needle is less visible than in manual syringes. The ability to consistently maintain slow, safe de um, deposition rate is one benefit of CCLAD devices because it results in reduced pain perception in adults and fewer pain-related disruptions among pediatric patients. CCLAD devices also offer rapid onset during administration of the periodontal ligament injection. This helps to address difficult to anesthetize teeth and improves the ability to administer supplemental injections when field or block anesthesia is incomplete. The administration of anesthesia with CCLAD devices offers ergonomic benefits for clinicians, including a reduction in the muscle activity and forces required to give injections and a decrease in the static postures necessary for local anesthesia administration. A previous publication discussed the ergonomic benefits, injection fluid dynamics, and needle positioning of CCLAD devices. This article will focus on implications of fluid pressure and tissue type when administering local anesthesia with CCLAD systems. So fluid pressure. Fluid pressures are created when plungers are depressed to create a, a flow of anesthetic into the tissue. Many clinicians routinely use small diameter 30 gauge needles during local anesthesia delivery, assuming they provide greater injection comfort compared to the larger diameters, the 27 gauge or 25 gauge needles. When considering the fluid dynamics of smaller diameter neater, needles, injection pressures with 30 gauge needles are actually higher than with 27 or 25 gauge needles. Increased injection pressure potentially results in increased pain and post-operative discomfort. In a study by Zafalaya, oh, I'm going to mess that up and I don't want to hear anything about that, and Sue, so, um, 10 uh, significantly more anesthetic significantly more anesthetic was expelled in the first, teen, first 15 seconds with the 27 gauge needle compared to 30 gauge needles. Overall, the authors found that more than 80% of the simulated depositions resulted in bursts capable of triggering injection pain during the first few seconds. CCLAD systems are, uh, are able to administer the anesthetic drop by drop during the initial stage of the injection with a slow, consistent increase in the injection rate over time, avoiding the pain caused by high fluid pressures. One CCLAD system also monitors and regula regulates real-time pressure generated at needle tips. The, this ensures the fluid dynamic pressures are continuously measured and limited to preset values in order to minimize fluid pressures. I've had this before. It actually is pretty easy. I barely knew what was happening. So tissue type. The oral cavity consists, consists of a variety of tissue types. Research has demonstrated that tissue-specific flow rates and optimal pressure values are needed for safe and comfortable injections. The three basic tissue classifications, type 1, type 2, and type 3, are based on compliance or distensibility. Type 1 refers to low-density tissues with high tissue compliance found in a 
uh, in the buccal mucosa and retromolar fossas. The optimal range of flow rate is greater than 0.005 milliliters a second and less than 0.03 milliliters a second, producing pressures from 9 PSI to 12 PSI. Type 2 includes moderate density tissue with moderate tissue compliance found in attached gingiva and palatal tissues. Oh, I hate injecting palatal tissues, which are less adaptive and require slow flow rates than type 1 tissues. The optimal flow rate is approximately 0.005 milliliters. Type 3 encompasses high density tissue with very low tissue compliance, minimal adaptive capacity. Found in periodontal ligaments, this type requires a fixed slow rate of 0.005 milliliters a second and produces a range of tissue pressure from 225 PSI to 350. These tissue types, relevant flow rates and pressure are summarized in the table that you can look up. So in the conclusion, patient comfort can be, signi can be a significant tr contributor to successful treatment outcomes and patient compliance with recare intervals. Strategies that support patient comfort may help to reduce stress for patients and clinicians. Implementing technologies such as CCLAD devices can reduce injection pressures and pain for the patients. Um, I would totally agree. I watch people all the time for their first time they're injecting, and I'm like, slow down, please. It burns, especially um, with those smaller gauge needles like she's talking about, those 30 gauges. Um, I think this is a very cool thing. Like I said, I have had it for a IA block, um, getting some amalgams taken out and replaced, and it was not bad at all. So definitely look into this, especially if you are doing a lot of injections in your office. Your dentist might already have one of these in the office, so take a look at it. We thanks again all of you listeners who take the time to listen to our experts that come on that are becoming better clinicians. Thank you always for your patient for your feedback about the podcast. And if you're looking to learn more or find out more, or if you've had really good success stories because you've done some of the t trips and um, techniques that these uh, experts are talking about. We love hearing about it. Tell your friends, share the podcast on social media, and don't forget to write us a review on iTunes. You can always shoot us an email at a tale of two hygienist.com or at gmail.com. Or you can send us a Facebook message um, on a Tale of Two Hygienist on a Facebook. And thanks again, everyone. And we will see you next week. Bye, y'all.